Um, as a kid, um, there are a lot of rules that you are given as a kid from your parents, right? Like we all have those rules, especially growing up and especially regarding some of the things that you are or are not allowed to watch, listen to, read. If you had good parents, they set a little bit of a standard. At certain ages, you might, that standard might have changed and those guidelines might have changed and the restrictions might have changed. But good parents set guidelines and restrictions and just like my, Erica and I do for our kids. And um, if you were that way, I was that way. As, as a kid, I had different guidelines and things I could and couldn't watch. My parents had rules that changed as I got older. Um, there were certain things I could and I could not listen to. Um, I could not listen to a stickered album. If you don't know what that is, um, that's an album that has parental advisory little logo on that. Um, so if it had that, I could not listen to it or have it, and I would beg my parents, and they would say no. So instead, we'd go to Walmart, and we would buy it there, because at Walmart, they would actually edit out the cuss words. So they would let me have that. Not like Instead, they're making me think of the cuss words when they're b- being edited out. Instead of hearing it. So I would go and I'd buy like a Sis of an Allen album like, and, and it'd be edited. It was weird. So I had that. That was a rule I had. Um, there are certain things I was and was not allowed to read. I could not read Harry Potter. Never read one. Never seen a movie. Um, I, I eventually will. I just never have. Um, I couldn't read Goosebumps. You guys remember Goosebumps? I don't. I don't remember it. I never read it. Um, then um, what else? I could not, there are certain things I could and couldn't watch when I was a certain age. I couldn't watch PG-13 movies because I wasn't old enough. When I got older, um, after a while, they're like, okay, we'll let you watch some of them, but no R-rated movies. And then there were certain shows I couldn't watch. I couldn't watch The Simpsons. I couldn't watch South Park. So like every good kid, I would just sneak behind them and watch it behind their back until they caught me. That's what I would do. Every kid growing up, or most kids grow, growing up, have some kind of rules of what they can listen to, what they can read, what they can watch. All the kids do that. I do the same thing. This standard that you maybe had or maybe you have for your kids is influenced by a lot of things. It's influenced um, by the way you grew up. It's influenced by your perspective when it comes to culture. It's influenced, of course, by your beliefs and your faith. It's influenced by a ton of things. My parents would let me listen to any music that was Christian, and I mean any. If it was like a hardcore band that was screaming the whole time, but it was Christian, they didn't care. They were all for it. Go ahead and listen to whatever you want as long as it's Christian because I grew up in a Christian home. But if the band had a certain message or cussed too much, and all of a sudden that was something I wasn't allowed to do. All good parents do something like that. But as I grew up, and if you grew up in, in Christian culture, you'll know this. If not, I'll explain it to you. As I grew up and I became older, I got into a youth group, I grew up in the church, I became a teenager, my Freedom was, I started to have more freedom when it came to what I listened to. I would still have a separation between, in my own head, no one taught me this, in my head I had a separation between what was Christian art, as in Christian books, Christian music, Christian um, movies, and the popular word was secular, secular art. This is secular music. This is secular um, shows. The, this is, there's a, there was a big distinction. In fact, in my car, I had CD binders. I had one CD binder that was full of Christian albums, DC Talk, POD, Audio Adrenaline, you know, those bands. And then I had a secular album that was all the bands that were not Christian, bands like Korn and like terrible bands like that. So I had two different albums that would separate between Christian and non-Christian or Christian and secular music. And as a pastor, I get these questions all the time regarding secular art. I get it all the time of what people, they're asking me if they're allowed to do this or that. Should Christians listen to secular music? I get that question all the time. Should Christians read things like Fifty Shades of Grey? Um, Should Christians go see R-rated movies? I get those questions all the time, and I understand where they come from. I understand why people have that. But throughout this series, we've been looking at God and culture, and how do we as followers of of God, as followers of Jesus, live out that faith in our culture? And in week one, if you didn't hear it, I I highly recommend you go back and, and, and watch that. But in week one, we define culture as the way we live in the world he created. That's what culture is. It's the way we live and interact and participate in what he has created. And we also talked about these two camps that we can easily fall into when it comes to culture as, as followers of Jesus. We can fall into the against culture camp. Culture is our enemy. We have to fight culture. We have to do whatever we can to protect ourselves from the enemy of culture. Or we can find ourselves in the other extreme camp of culture. You know what? I'm a Christian, but I'm also going to do whatever culture tells me to do. I'm also going to live a normal life. I'm going to look just like everybody else. I'm just going to have this faith in Jesus at the same time. And art, music, movies, books, Art is the easiest thing 
for us to fall into one of those two camps, against it or of it. It's so easy for us to be in one of those two camps where we're like, you know what? We can't watch certain things. You know what? We're not going to be doing certain things. We're, we're going to pretend that we're only going to read certain books. Or, you know what? I'm a Christian, but I'm just still going to watch whatever I want. I'm going to read whatever I want. I'm going to listen to whatever I want because I'm of culture. It's so easy for us to fall in those two camps. And when I get those questions, should a Christian do this? Should they read this? Should they watch this? I think that's a bad question. I understand why, but I think it's a bad question. And I believe that when you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. When you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. Should I participate in this? It's a bad question. Am I allowed to do this? It's a bad question. When you ask the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answers. I believe that there is a better question to ask when it comes to art the art that we consume, the art that we partake in, there's a better question to ask. But before we get to that question, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. If you have your Bible, your Bible apps, you can open up now to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to read this whole chapter. Um, and Paul isn't specifically talking about art here. He's talking about something else. But this chapter and what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth can really lead us into the right direction when it comes to the better question to ask when it comes to us and the and the culture of art. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, a little um, background on what's happening here. In 1 Corinthians, there's the church in Corinth, and, he's, and Paul is writing this letter to this church in Corinth, answering a bunch of questions. He spent the first couple chapters answering questions about marriage and about singleness, and now he's getting to their next question. And their next question was, what do we do when it comes to food that has been sacrificed to idols? That's their question. So back then, what would happen in pagan religions they would take meat and they would go to pagan altars and they would sacrifice an animal and put the meat on the altar to, to their pagan gods. And after they did that, when it was over, they would take that meat and they would separate it into thirds. The first third, they would burn up as a sacrifice to our pagan god. That's where it's going to. The second third, the, the person who brought the meat would take it home. That was theirs to keep. Then the third third, they would take that, and the priest who performed that ritual would be able to take that home with them and eat it, and it would be, it'd be kind of like their payment. Well, the priests a lot of times would have a lot of meat. Um, so maybe they performed a, a lot of sacrifices that week, and their freezer was full. And so yeah, they all this meat, and they don't know what to do with it. So what they would often do is sell it. They would go to pagan temples or pagan restaurants, and they would sell this meat. Now, this meat was normally a very good price because it was pre-selling it, it was extra stuff, they're just trying to get rid of it more than anything else. So this meat was a really good price, and Christians back then are just like us, everyone likes a bargain. So I know you shop at all these, I do too. There's a reason why we shop there, we like bargains. So Christians would buy this meat that were sacrificed to pagan gods because it was a good deal. They would go into the pagan temples or pagan restaurants and do it. Now all of a sudden they started having this debate with each other. Should we be doing this? Because this meat was sacrificed to a God we don't believe in and to, for a religion that we don't believe in that is counter our religion, should we be eating and buying and participating in this meat when really it's against what we should be doing? So Paul answers that question, and I believe the way he answers this question leads us to the correct answer when it comes to art. So starting in verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Do you notice Paul starts answering the question without anything to do with food? He just goes right to this other thing about knowledge and love. He doesn't even talk about food. Instead, he talks about this principle that I think is important for us to understand, knowledge and love. You see, our belief and our faith is not built on knowledge. Yes, we need to have knowledge. Yes, the more you understand how this world works, I believe you're going to learn more about God. Yes, knowledge is important, but that's not our foundation of our faith. Our foundation of our faith is love. It's not knowledge, it's love. Love for God and love for others. When we try to make our foundation on knowledge, what, what Paul says, it, it puffs us up. It makes it all about us. But when we make our foundation be love, it edifies. It makes us better. It improves us. Knowledge puffs us up like a bubble, where Paul would say love builds us up like a building. Verse 2, those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. I remember being in high school, and uh, I was in youth group, and um, I really understood my theology and my faith like concrete, I could argue, anybody, because I knew exactly what I believed. I knew all the answers to all the questions. 
as I've gotten older, I'm 35 now, as I've gotten older, um, I know more theology today than I definitely did in high school, more than I've ever known. I've read more books this year than I ever read in high school, which is not a lot, by the way. I just never read in high school. Um, I know a lot more now, and here's what I've learned at 35. The more I know about theology and about faith and about uh, how the world works, the more I understand I don't know anything. So in high school, I was cocky. I was like, I knew it all. But now, I have more knowledge than ever, and I have no idea what's happening because I understand all the things that I don't know. And that's what Paul is saying here. Those who think they know something, yet they don't actually know. So Paul reminds them that the most important thing is love, not knowledge. And then he addresses their question in verse 4. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Here's what Paul is saying here. Listen, Corinthians, we all understand that there's only one God. We get that. You understand that? I understand that. We understand that these pagans are sacrificing to a made-up God, that these rituals aren't actually doing anything because there is no other God. There's only one God. If they're offering food to Zeus, we know that Zeus isn't real, so that food is really just meat. It's not that big a deal because it's offering it to nothing. So what he's basically saying is, and what he's concluding is, since these idols are literally nothing, it means nothing to eat meat sacrificed to nothing idols. It means nothing to eat in these buildings and worship because they're worshiping nothing. So what he's basically saying is, hey, you're allowed to. There's nothing wrong with it. You can buy that food. You can eat it. You're allowed to do that. But Paul isn't done. And he's on. Verse 7. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. The church in Corinth understood meat correctly. They had the right knowledge. They understood that they were allowed to. They were, they were correct in that thinking and in that knowledge that they were allowed to eat that food. But Paul says, listen, not everyone has the knowledge that you have. Not everyone understands it the way you do. Some people believe that there are still idols out there. And some people that are followers of Jesus still believe that. So if they were to eat that meat or see you eat that meat, it is defiled to them because of their weak conscience. And Paul is not insulting them. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that their conscience isn't, it's not that it's not working, it's rather overworking. Their conscience is being informed by the knowledge that they have. The knowledge is incorrect, but their conscience can only be informed by what they know. So he's saying, listen, if people think that this is wrong because of an incorrect knowledge, their conscience is only going to use that. So for them, it is wrong, even though you know it's not wrong. So he continues on here. He says in verse 8, but food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Here's what he's saying. You're, you're smart. You know that food doesn't really matter or you're sacrificed to a nothing God. It doesn't really matter. You know that. So you eating that food because you understand that does not mean that you are closer to God. You, you haven't learned any, any certain trick. And the opposite is true. Those people not eating it because they think that they shouldn't because it's defiled They are not any further away from God than you. And then verse 9 says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Because you understand that there is nothing wrong with eating it, you have the liberty and the freedom to do it. But Paul is saying, somebody else who thinks it's wrong because their conscience is telling them that, and they see you eating it, and it makes them stumble, that's on you. You did something. Your knowledge did not save them. We should be using our knowledge to save others. And he gets really clear in verse 12. When you sin against them in this way and wound their conscience... You sin against Christ. Paul is telling them, Paul is telling us, that if we use our knowledge and our liberty in a way that is permissible, that means you are allowed to do it, 
There's nothing wrong with it. Your knowledge, you understand that you are allowed to. You've grown your faith, and your knowledge is correct. You're allowed to do it. But that knowledge and liberty goes against someone else's weak conscience, as in they don't have as much knowledge as you, then we are sinning against Christ by doing it. That's some pretty harsh words there. Then verse 13, he says, Therefore, what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin. I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Here's the point that Paul is is making and the point that we have to understand. Our actions are never solely based on what is right for us. It's never solely on that. Love considers what is right towards everyone. Love considers what is right for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love considers other people. And you'll hear your people say things like, uh, I answer to God and to God alone, and that is true, but you will answer to God for how you treated other people. So love is the embrace. So some of you might be thinking, but they were right. I mean, they were allowed to do it. And Paul says it doesn't matter if you're right. What is best for everyone? What's the best way you can show love for someone else? If you're married in the room, you know this. You can be right and be wrong, right? You can be right and you have the right opinion, and that's great. Knowledge is great. Being right is great. But you know what's better? Love. Doing what's best for that other person. And Paul is saying love is better than your knowledge. You might have it right. You might have it right. But if it causes someone else to stumble in their walk, the most loving thing you can do, which is the most important thing, is to esteem, is to not do it. And in fact, if you know that, it's a sin for you to do it. So I know what you may be thinking. You may be thinking things like this. All right, Eric, so you're saying that if anybody is offended by anything I watch or anything I read or anything I listen to, I can't do any of it. So if someone were to say, hey, PG movies offend me, now I can't watch PG movies anymore. That, is that what you're saying? Because if it offends someone else, then I have to all of a sudden be underneath their umbrella, and now I have to not watch it because now it's a sin for me because that's what Paul says. Is that what you're telling me? And I would say no to that. And here's why. Paul isn't saying that, um, Paul isn't saying that either. Paul would never allow this principle to be used as a way for legalism to make demands on a Christian walking in liberty. In, in fact, in Galatians 2, Peter was associating with uh, these Jewish leaders that, um, that were trying to enforce a law that they weren't supposed to enforce. They were, they were practicing legalism. They were saying, everyone needs to do this when the Bible didn't say, and Jesus didn't say you had to do that. And what did, Pe- what did Paul do to Peter, who was the first pope, who, um, who was a, a major disciple? He strongly rebuked Peter for doing that. So he's not saying we can now do legalism because of it. If something I do is going to cause you to be tempted and to stumble in your walk with Christ, that it's going to mess up your conscience and you're going to do something that you think is wrong and that the Spirit is telling you is wrong, then it is my responsibility in love to do whatever I can to keep you from stumbling, even if it means doing something that I am allowed to do, even if it means me stopping that for your sake. However, if what I'm doing is offending your legalism, I'm going to happily do it. I'm not worried about your legalism. I'm worried about your walk. That's what I'm worried about. Here's how John Wesley would call the people that use this idea to enforce things, people, to, and to enforce things in legalism ways. John Wesley would call it uh, sour godliness. I love this, this quote. He says this, sour godliness is the devil's religion. It does not owe its inception to truly spiritual people. I suspect that sour godliness originated among unhappy, semi-religious people who had just enough religion to make them miserable, but not enough to do them any good. So when Paul, so when we say, so when we understand what Paul is saying about food, that yeah, it might be acceptable, yeah, you might be allowed to do that, you have the knowledge, you're right, but if it's going to hurt someone else, then just out of love, don't do it. When we understand that concept, I believe it pushes us towards the right question. Again, the wrong question is, what am I allowed to watch? Can I read this book? Can I listen to this? Here's what I think is a better question for every aspect of life, and specifically art, because that's what we're talking about today. Is love influencing every aspect of my life? Is love influencing every aspect of my life? Am I building my faith on that foundation of love or on knowledge? Is your love for Christ and your love for other people, the most important thing in your life. 
Because I believe when we stop focusing on those bad questions and we stop focusing on uh, things that, that don't matter as much and we focus on this question, I believe everything will work itself out. Is love influencing every aspect of my life? So let me talk to the two camps really quick. Camps that are against culture. Some of us and some of you watching at home would fall under this camp where all of a sudden we are against culture when it comes to art. You believe that we shouldn't watch anything that doesn't have an overtly biblical message to it. You believe that we shouldn't listen to anything but Christian music, and you believe we shouldn't read any book except for the Bible and anything Joel Osteen or Joyce Myers puts out. That's the camp you're in. Now, we got to push all that away. We got to protect ourselves. We got to be careful. Here's the problem with that view you are shrinking and minimalizing God's creativity. God is a creative God. When you decide to only allow yourself to take what the Christian industry stamped and also makes money on, by the way, when you allow yourself to only take in that, that's the only thing you're allowed to do, then you're going to get bad content. I don't mean bad theology. I mean just bad. It's not as good. It's not as creative. And we serve a God who is creative and amazing and beautiful and art thrives on non-utilitarian. Art isn't solely meant to just transmit a message. It is meant to be breathable space where the glory of creativity is manifested. That's why that there are so many Christian movies that you may watch that just aren't very good. Here's why a lot of those aren't good. Their main point is to push this message across, and they're going to sacrifice everything else to push that message. There's no creativity involved. They, they put the creativity out of the way because you need to get this message that we're trying to deliver. But that's not how creativity thrives. And that's, not why, and that's why Jesus didn't just tell you messages. That's why Jesus didn't just say, hey, this is what you have to do. Jesus told story after story after story because he used creativity to do that because he understood what stories do. In, in uh, Corinthians, Paul, he says, he says this, says, bad company corrupts good morals. You may maybe have heard that. Bad company corrupts good morals. Do you know that Paul didn't make that up? Paul was actually quoting a pagan philosopher. In fact, Paul quotes four different pagan philosophers in his letters. So even he is using a culture outside of himself to show the glory of God and his creativity, what he does. So listen, if, if watching and listening and reading whatever you are affects your conscience, you should not do it. You feel convicted. If you feel like, I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't read that, I shouldn't listen to that, then you should not do it. However, if you're pushing everything out that is secular, and forcing this wrong belief on everyone else, not only are you sinning by doing that, but you aren't experiencing the creativity and the beauty that is found in God's creation. That's the against culture camp. But let me talk to the of culture camp. I believe a lot of us in this room and a lot of us watching are more in this camp, of culture, the opposite extreme. I believe in God, and I'm going to watch whatever I want. I'm going to read whatever I want. I'm going to listen to whatever I want because you can't tell me what to do. That's called legalism. If you are standing up here and say, you can't watch that, you can't listen to that, you can't read that, so I'm going to do whatever I want because I believe in God, I can do anything, I have freedom in Christ. We are really good at justifying this. I know we are. We'll say things like, well, Passion of the Christ is R-rated, so I can watch any R-rated movie now because you can't tell me I can't because Passion of the Christ is R-rated. So now I'm going to watch everything. No matter what the message is, I'm going to watch it because I can do that. We'll say things like, you know what, don't, don't tell me what I, what I can and can't listen to. I am just experiencing the beauty of music that God created as I listen to WAP. I, do you think I knew about that song? I know about that song. See, we do that. We're really good at justifying this. We're really good at justifying this. Let me tell you some verses that should really alarm some of us. 1 John chapter 2 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives Forever. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what's God's, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Loving the world also means that we let our, our creativity, and I mean loving the world as in loving them and caring for the world, caring for our brothers and sisters. When we love them, 
It means we allow our creativity and the creativity that we consume to be around the obedience of Christ. A lot of times we think that creativity and obedience is opposite, but it's not. The opposite of obedience isn't freedom. The opposite of obedience is captivity. Obedience is a choice. Captivity isn't. And the problem with submission is not the act itself, but a lot of times it's the person to whom we submit to. So does the one that you submit to hold the keys to your prison or hold the keys to the kingdom? See, you are free in Christ. You are free in him. Freedom doesn't mean doing, watching, reading, and listening to whatever you want. It means you understand what Christ has done for you so the love you have been given and you have chooses obedience and submission, discipline. We don't want to be people that are against culture, We sure don't want to be people that are of culture because you need to understand, just like I need to understand, things we watch, things we listen to, the things we read, it influences our soul. It affects our soul. It can damage and hurt our soul. So if we're not supposed to be against culture, we're not supposed to be of culture, we're supposed to be in and for culture. So if we're asking the question, is love influencing every aspect of my life in regards to the art we consume? I'm going to really quickly close with three very practical ways that you can start doing this. I'm not going to be up here, and I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't listen to. I'm not also going to give you permission to watch and listen to and read whatever you want. Instead, I'm going to give you just some very quick, very brief guidelines, because we're running out of time, very quickly, some guidelines that you can start applying in your life, and then the worship team's going to come and play, close the song. First one, find truth. Find truth. God has a monopoly on truth. If it is truth, whoever delivered it, it doesn't matter. If it is truth, it is God's because God is truth. Truth is truth and God owns and has a monopoly on all truth. So when you watch and read and listen to something, look for the truth it's trying to speak. Because everything we, we partake in and we consume is trying to give some kind of message. So look for that truth. And at times you may watch something that has nothing to do with Christianity and you're going to find truth in it. And sometimes the truth you're going to find is that truth that they're trying to preach to me, I don't agree with. That will give you a little red flag, a little cue of what you should do. But there are going to be times where you watch shows that are far from Christ, that are far from Christianity, but you're going to come out of it if you're looking for truth, be like, I've learned something and I've grown in my faith from this show that's not trying to glorify God, but God can use anything and anyone to preach truth to me. Let me give you an example of that. Um, I've thought this before, but I'm a big Breaking Bad fan. It's my favorite show of all time. If you've never watched it, really quickly, it's about a science teacher who gets cancer, and he starts to worry, and he gets, um, he knows he's going to leave nothing to his family, so he starts um, cooking meth because he's really good at it, and then eventually he goes down a path where all of a sudden he went from cooking meth to help his family to now he's like a, a drug kingpin, and he's killing people and doing whatever it takes to keep his empire going. Here's why I like that show, and here's the truth that I think you can find in that show. It is the best show I've ever watched when it comes to showing us the human condition. That one little thing, I'm just trying to help my family, led to one step, led to one step, and before you knew it, he was down a path of destruction that he could not come back from, and at the end, he even talks about it, it was all about me. It was all about pride. I believe we can see a lot of glimpses of sin and the damage it can do in your life and the need for a savior in a show like Breaking Bad. You can find truth in a lot of different things, so always look for truth, number one. Number two, listen to the Spirit. Spirit guides you, Spirit leads you, and most importantly, especially for this topic, the Spirit convicts you. There should be times where you watch, read, or listen to something, and you feel convicted about it, so you stop. I can't watch this. I can't listen to this. I can't do this. You don't need to make a big deal about it. You don't need to go tell everybody else, hey, I can't watch this. You can't watch this either. That's legalism. Instead, you're going to look at it and go, I cannot, it does not sit well with me. I I cannot do this. We should have times that we do that. So when was the last time you were convicted and stopped participating in something like that? You can't think about it. If you can't think of a time, that should be a red flag for you. That means that maybe we are not attuned to the Spirit enough. And you should spend some more time connecting with yourself, connect with your Savior, because we should not be watching everything that comes out or listening to everything that comes out. So here's some like very practical guidelines. Again, I'm not telling you you, can, you have to do this. Here's some guidelines that I've heard that I think can be helpful when it comes to figuring out um, what you should or shouldn't listen to and listen to the Spirit. 
I, I've heard people that say, you know what, I'm just not going to watch R-rated movies. I'm just going to throw them all out. I'm not doing that. That's not for me. That's my guardrail that I'm going to have so I don't fall into a trap of sin because the Spirit has led me there. I'm not going to watch anything with nudity in it. If it has nudity in it, I'm out. I'm not watching that. Um, I'm not going to listen to anything that has a parental advisory sticker. It's not going to listen to it. It's not for me. I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm not going to listen to anything that talks derogatory about women. Gonna, if it does, I'm out. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to read anything that's solely about sex. not going to do that. I've heard those things before. We should have those kind of guardrails in our life so that we can protect ourselves from the damage of, of taking in certain things. Listen to the Spirit. Number three, make priorities. Ultimately, this will influence everything else. If you make growing in your faith a priority, this area will begin to take care of itself. Think of it this way. If, if I want to grow my relationship with Erica, the only way for me to do that is to make her a priority. I'm going to clean the house because I know that she likes that. So if I want to grow my relationship with her, then I'm going to pick up around the house. If, if I want to grow my relationship with her, I'm going to spend time with her. If I want to grow my relationship with her, I'm going to sacrifice things that I am perfectly allowed to do, but I know that I shouldn't because of her. I can play video games all day. I have to sacrifice that because I want to spend time with the person I love the most. I want to sacrifice for that. I'm making her a priority. In the same way, make your faith a priority. When you do, when you make sure you spend time with your Savior and you make sure you are growing in your walk, when you do that, you will begin to look at what you watch, at what you read, and at what you listen to differently. Is this helping me be a better follower of Christ? Is this helping me be a better spouse? Is this helping me be a better parent? Ask the right questions. When it comes to our relationship with art, the best question is not, am I allowed to do this? But it's, is love influencing every aspect of my life? And when we try to answer that, it will inform you of what you should watch, listen to, and read. The art you should consume. Let's pray. Dear God, we just give this day to you. We just surrender our lives to you. And dear God, we know that um, our faith is built on love. So dear God, I pray that you help us to, to live a life that shows love for you and love for others. And that even if we are allowed to partake and participate in certain aspects of culture, that you help love lead us. So we can say no to things that do not build love for you and build love for each other. God, I pray that you convict us on what we should or shouldn't be watching. That you, that you, you touch us and speak to us in a way so we leave here, we can make some changes because we know the dangers of what we, we, we participate in. And I pray that you help us to have love be that foundation so we can glorify you and what we do. In your son's name, amen. Let's sing, let's sing this closing song.